good to see you all once again. Pray with me. Uh, Father, we're here today to uh, install Pastor Kevin officially. He's here, and we trust your blessing upon his ministry. And we ask God now as we look at your word that you would open it to our hearts and you'd plant your truth deep within us, that you'd transform us from the inside out, that we might fulfill the good purposes to which you have called Kevin here and us here in this place to serve you for your kingdom and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, the installation of a new pastor is a significant milestone in any congregation. Um, this is a, a new chapter that's opening up in the life of the church, and we're just so delighted and thankful that you've invited us back to be a part of this. And, and it's fitting that we do this, that we acknowledge this inauguration of Pastor Kevin's ministry here with, with a special emphasis in this service and the laying on of hands with the elders it's customary during an installation service um, to give a charge to the new pastor to say something to him and then to say something to the congregation uh, by way of, of challenge. And this we will endeavor to do this morning, Lord willing. So, Pastor Kevin, I'm going to start talking to you and the rest of you can go get coffee or whatever you do when <laughs> pastor's preaching. You're no novice when it comes to ministry. Um, you, you were raised in a pastor's home. You share a ministry heritage with both of your brothers, one of whom is now with the Lord. Um, you've already served a num number of churches. So uh, there's not much that I could say to you that you probably don't already know. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not going to try and teach you something new or say something like that, but rather, as, as the Apostle Peter wrote, to stir up your sincere mind by way of reminder about the nature of pastoral ministry. In Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he, he gave us a glimpse into how he viewed ministry. His ministry leadership was being challenged, and he's talking about that. And scattered throughout a larger discussion in chapters 3 and 4, Paul makes three significant statements about ministry, the nature of ministry. And the first is in chapter 3, beginning at verse 4. He says, such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. No man standing before the congregation of God's people does so out of the magnitude and magnificence of his gifts and abilities and personality. Um, his character, his gifting for ministry, his enablement, his power, come from the indwelling Spirit of God. Our sufficiency is from God who made us sufficient to be ministers. These words ought to be carved on every pulpit in America. Pastor, your sufficiency is from God. Um, I, I, I pray that they are etched upon your heart. Um, they call those of us in vocational ministry to, I, I think, both humility and confidence. Humility because God would choose ordinary doofuses like us to dare to stand before God's people and declare to them the word of God. Um, to serve Christ in his kingdom and the overwhelming responsibility and privilege of teaching the Bible, of shepherding God's people. Humility. Um, Confidence solely because of the sufficiency of God who has given us the competency to do so. Uh, the movie Chariots of Fire, Olympic champion Eric Liddell told his sister, he says, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. I hope when you stand here and preach, you feel God's pleasure. You feel his sufficiency. When you minister to feel the pure joy of being used by God to serve God's people. Um, and I pray that you beware the constant, constant temptation of thinking to yourself, these people are sure fortunate to have me here. <laughs> Rather, we are so fortunate to be able to be here 
and to serve them for the glory of God. Our sufficiency is from God. And then in chapter 4, Paul says, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. No man deserves the privilege of leading his church. No man goes through seminary and training and all of this work and comes to the point of competency and says, Now, you owe me. I ought to be here. <laughs> having this ministry by the mercy of God. The mercy of God. We have this ministry because we have been recipients of the mercy of God. God has not treated us like we deserve, or none of us would be here. Um, we do not occupy the pulpit because of our education, our extraordinary gift set, our erudition, our ability to speak, um, Christ has called us and rescued us from great condemnation. And, and he has forgiven great spiritual moral debts. And he has implanted his spirit in us who is making us holy and shaping Christ in us. We proclaim God's mercy because we have received God's mercy. And until a man understands that deeply from the heart, he's not fit to stand before other people and talk to them about their need for the mercy of God because it is out of our own awareness of God's mercy that we proclaim God's mercy. And because of the mercy of God, we don't lose heart because it's not all on us. Ministry is hard. You know that. Ministry today is especially hard. The, the, the church is reeling from titanic shifts in our culture um, of how this our, our, the people around us understand how the world ought to be. Christianity is no longer considered part of the solution, but rather Christianity is viewed as part of the problem. Organized religion is part of the problem. We also serve a celebrity culture in which fame and success are worshipped and applauded. This seeps into congregations. And some of the people sitting here this morning have already watched a service on TV. And they've watched media preachers who have shimmering personalities, great eloquence, marvelous stages, platforms. <laughs> Professional musicians, excellent quality of production. And they've heard these people preach the word of God with eloquence and power, and, and, and then they come and they listen to us. That's a tough sell. We're not celebrities, but sometimes we're compared to celebrities. It's not easy. The COVID epidemic has been especially tough on pastors and churches, and, and we're a little bit removed from it now, but we're still feeling the effects of the cultural divides that that rend politics and culture today are, are uh, they 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 tore at the bonds that knit believers to want to get one another in worship because of the COVID crisis, and and it's it's it was a significant crisis. It resulted in the deaths of over a million Americans during that time. But during that crisis, the battle cry of some was faith, not fear. You ever hear anybody say that? Faith, not fear. And these demanded that we ignore precautions and refuse masks and continue to live and do ministry without restrictions because we're going to trust God. And for the battle cry for others was prudence, not presumption. And they demanded that we all mask up and the church services be discontinued for a while, suspended, and that we observe social distancing. And then they all came together and we had to live through that, and, and it tore churches apart. The battle was joined. <laughs> and then we have the passion stirred up by our coming election in a month and a half. Many are more committed to their political persuasions than the kingdom of God. That's a tough thing for pastors to deal with. Um, this week I, I read a letter from a leading evangelical who said, a family I know and love was rattled recently to get a note from someone they considered a lifetime, lifetime friend, suggesting that the family was going to hell. And the cause for the impending brimstone was not that the 
family denied the faith, embraced some heresy, or adopted some unrepentant life of immorality, at issue was that the family didn't support a particular presidential candidate. This sort of situation comes to me at least once a week these days. Those are the passions that are stirred up in congregations over politics. And we're the, the kingdom of God, the church of the living God. This is the world in this time and place that you have this ministry by the mercy of God. So don't lose heart. God is still God. And he still has plans and purposes for his congregation. And then, in chapter 4, verse 5, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. And ourselves as your servants, Paul said, slaves, for Jesus' sake. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And by the way, congregation, Paul did not say, we are your slaves. <laughs> he said, we are Christ's slaves for your sake. All right, let's get that clear. Um, no man of God who is faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ makes much of himself. It's not our purpose. He celebrates the privilege of being called pastor by accepting the posture of a servant. We're in bondage to Christ for the sake of those we serve. And wisdom calls us to serve out of our primary gifts and calling. Um, the apostles, remember, in Acts chapter 6, uh, were dealing with an issue in the church, and he says it's not right that we leave the ministry of the word and prayer and wait on tables. Now, they weren't saying we're too proud to wait on tables. They're saying God has given us this to do. We have to focus on this. Now, let's make sure that the, the need gets taken care of. We have to work out of our primary gifts and calling. But the humility of a servant will not balk at the most servile task for the sake of Jesus' bride. I, I can tell this story because um, the, the lady that was involved in this um, actually shared it on Facebook, so I feel the freedom to share this with you. But we have a, a lady in our church there at Bethel who is blind, and she has a, a, a prosthetic, a, a glass eye. And she called me one day, and she says, I, I dropped my eye down the sink drain. Could you help, come and help me? <laughs> God didn't call me to be a plumber. But... I went over to her house and took the drain apart, took the trap apart, and that's not difficult. You know, if you can, you know, which way to turn it, those things, you can take it apart. Fished out the eye and washed it up and gave her back her eye, and put it all back together. We can't be too proud to do that kind of stuff to serve our people. Um, we can't spend all of our time running around doing that kind of stuff. But as the occasion calls for it, we don't balk at the most servile task for the sake of Jesus' bride. We serve not to be seen, but so that Jesus can be seen. And so we consider ourselves ordinary clay pots. We have this treasure in jars of clay. <laughs> But the glory is in the treasure, not the pot. By this, we, 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 we serve knowing that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And we don't stand up there and say, look at me, look at what a great man I am. No, we look up here and we say, look at Christ and what a great Christ we have. What a great Savior we have. Because the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. I believe at this moment in history, with Christianity in decline in America, it's vital for pastors and churches to recover this truth. That the surpassing power in ministry belongs to God and not to us. May God's Spirit anoint you with His power and grant you in this place an influence beyond your capacity to accomplish His purposes beyond your ministry skills and experience, 
to bless you beyond anything you could ask or imagine because you really believe in his mercy and grace and for his own purposes and glory, God has lifted you up and he has placed you here to lift up Jesus Christ before Calvary Church and before this community in which we are embedded. And so a word to the congregation. You know, when churches search for a new pastor, um, they do typically exactly what we have done. We call in a denominational consultant who helps us put together a comprehensive analysis of the congregation, of the strengths, the weakness. We develop profiles of the church and of the candidate that we like and the ideal person. And they help us crystallize our vision of the perfect candidate, usually somebody in their mid-30s with a doctorate and 25 years of experience. A charismatic personality in a family with a perfect wife and shining children and they're independently wealthy. That helps because, you know, we want pastors to be poor and humble and God will keep them humble and will keep them poor. The ideal candidate will be a visionary leader and perfectly pastoral, eloquent in the pulpit, wise and compassionate to counsel, fearlessly evangelistic. Somebody who's going to attract other young people who are just like us and the church is going to grow and blossom and we're going to all going to have a wonderful time because we've picked the perfect guy. Now, we laugh at that because we know, yeah, that's not, that's not true. That's how it works. But you know something? As, as we do this search process and we go through this process and we put together the profile and so on like that, as much as we're called to prayer in the search, the, the nature of the, of the search is, is kind of like preaching, preacher shopping. Um, we're, we've, we've got resumes out there and, and we're looking through all of these things to find the right fit. And, and it's right that we do that. There's wisdom in that. But it feeds a subtle deception in our minds that we just need to get the right guy because if we get the right guy, all of our problems are over and the church is going to flourish, flourish and we're going to grow and we can sit back and bask in the glory because pastor's here now and so he can do all the work. We have asked for God's man in God's time and we have asked to give us the man of God's own choosing according to the needs that God sees in us and not according to the desires and our wants. And at the same time, we have a hard time not loading on Pastor Kevin the sole responsibility for the health and vitality of this church. Well, keep in mind what we said to Pastor Kevin. The surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We need to cry out to God for him to manifest his power through the life and ministry of Pastor Kevin and this congregation. When the Apostle Paul wrote the church in Corinth, he addressed a congregation obsessed with celebrity. <laughs> Paul had been the founding pastor, and there were people there who just loved Paul. I mean, he led them to Christ. He discipled them. And, and, and then others were there. Peter, the Apostle Peter, was there for a period of time. And, and there were other people who were just drawn to his, his dynamic leadership style, his personality. He was decisive. He just, you know, he might be wrong, but he was going to go for it anyway. And they just loved that about him. And then uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Apollos who was an eloquent speaker powerful orator and there were people who just loved to hear him preach and they followed you know, and so you had the the paulites and the peterites and the apollosites <laughs> and they just irritated each other now you don't have multiple staff here but you've had multiple pastors and some of your memories go way way back You've come from other churches, you've had pastors you've loved, and you've got this one that you like this, and so on like that, and then what, what we tend to do is accumulate all the best qualities of all the pastors we've ever known and expect this man to live up to all of them. It's part of the celebrity culture that we develop. Um, so Paul wrote them, and he says, what then is Apollos? What's Paul? They're servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered. But then what does he say? Who gave the growth? God did. God did. The same truth we offered Pastor Kevin. 
The surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. The psalmist reminded us, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. The night before he died, Jesus told his disciples, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. The proof of a congregation's confidence in God's power is the vitality of its prayer life. I really believe that. Jesus emphasized that when he, when he said, if you abide in me and my, and my words abide in me, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. We like the promise, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of things I could wish for. But we forget the condition. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. You see, when we abide in Jesus, when, when we are connected to Jesus like a branch of the grapevine is connected to the vine, his life flows in us and through us, and his words get down deep inside of us, and when that happens, our wants and our wishes change, and they begin to align with what God wants. We're going to desire to be fruitful in ways that glorify the Father. And when we desire to do the things that glorify the Father, and we're abiding in Jesus, we ask for different things for the glory of God, and not for the building up of our own private empires. And our prayers reflect the heart of Christ and a passion to glorify God, and the Father is eager to respond to those kinds of prayers. Contemporary Christian thinker and writer Trevin Wax wrote recently, You will never think prayer is a good use of your time if you're thinking of prayer in terms of usefulness. In other words, does prayer work? That's the wrong starting point. Here's a hard truth. If your prayer life feels superficial and shallow, it's usually a reflection of the superficiality and shallowness of what's inside of you. Prayer holds up a mirror and shows us the pathetic condition of our hearts. We flip from request to request for what we think we want while missing the deeper desires God wants to give us. Over time, praying works on us from the inside out, inviting us into communion with the Father, who delights to hear us even when we sound childish and immature. We're his kids, and he loves us, and he smiles to see us growing up in the fullness of faith. As I read this, I have a mental image in my mind of going to Bethel when, my, when the triplets were just little, um, they're, they're 16 years old and driving in high school, and... <laughs> Really, they're still fun. But I, I would walk into the lobby, and they'd see me across the lobby, and they'd say, oh, grandpa, 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 they all come running and jump all over me. And I'd be in it. just, man, that is so cool. <laughs> you ever think of God seeing you come to him and say, so cool, I love my kids. We're his kids, and he loves us, and he smiles to see us growing up in the fullness of faith. And as we echo the words of the psalmist, as we join our voices to the great saints of old, as we soak in the scriptures, we find our hearts growing larger. Perseverance in prayer leads to transformation of our desires. The surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. If we truly believe that, it will show up in how much and how often we pray as individuals, but especially together. Men will gather to lift up holy hands without wrath or quarreling. 
as Paul instructed Timothy to teach the church at Ephesus. Women will gather to intercede with God for their families in the church family. The whole congregation will gather to offer supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings for all people, and we will devote ourselves to prayer in accordance with the command of Scripture. I challenge you to become known as a praying church. A, a, a church on its knees before God, not because you're skilled at praying, but because you're not skilled at praying. But you want to know God. And one of the best ways to know God is on your knees before Him. Not because you feel like it, because you probably won't but because you're hungry and thirsty for God and what only God can offer. And we're willing to believe God's promises for blessing and growth. And then one more thing to consider. In his letter to the church at Ephesus, the Apostle Paul wrote, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. You know what Paul is saying there? God gave apostles and prophets, evangelists, shepherds, pastors, and teachers. God gave pastors and teachers to churches to equip you to do the work of ministry. Uh, Pastor Kevin is a gift from our risen Lord Jesus Christ to Calvary Church. So if you ever tempted to think, well, who does he think he is? God's gift to the church? Yep. <laughs> yep. Paul wrote three long chapters about spiritual gifts when he penned his first letter to the church at Corinth, but as he began, he, he said something significant. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brother, I, I don't want you to be uninformed, un, uninformed. There are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. There are various or varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, or the King James says, operations, the New American Standard, there are a variety of effects, there are varieties of working, but the same God. So you have the Holy Spirit distributing the gifts, you have Jesus assigning those gifts a place of service, and you have God the Father determining how effective those gifts are going to be in that place of service. And simply put, that you have a man here whom God has sovereignly gifted by the Holy Spirit, a specific gift mix of spiritual capacities for serving Christ, the bride of Christ. And Jesus has assigned him to this place. And God the Father himself is going to make that ministry powerful according to his purposes. The, the, the Holy Trinity is involved in giving you a pastor. Now, he is accountable to God for the stewardship entrusted to him. And we are accountable to God for how we treat God's gift. As you think back over the men under whose ministry you sat. Consider the words of the writers of Hebrews. He says, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. As you think about Pastor Kevin and the other elders who, who stand with him in this church, the same writer of Hebrews said this, obey your leaders and submit to them which is what every red-blooded American who loves freedom and independence likes to hear. <laughs> Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, because that would be unprofitable for you. That would not be of no advantage to you. And then he adds, 
Pray for us. Jesus has given Pastor Kevin to us. Honor that gift and pray for him and respect him and be responsive to his preaching and leadership and give him reasons to rejoice at his calling here. Because if you grumble and complain and push back and say, no, he's not this or he's not that compared to him, you know, <sighs> that's not profitable for you. That's going to tear you apart. In my experience, the greater the strengths one may have in specific areas, the greater weaknesses he's going to have in others. And, and pastors are just that way. You know, we've got some gifts that are really good, and we think, wow, we wish, you know. And then he's got other things that just doesn't do so very well. I, I go back to my church at Bethel, and we have a new pastor now, and I really love Pastor Jordan. He's doing a wonderful job, and we have a whole group of elders there. And by the way, that's why God gave a plurality of elders, because one man never has all the gifts necessary to take care of a congregation. So he's given us a group of men who together have that collection of gifts that meet the needs of the church. But I thank God for the guys in our church who have wonderful pastoral lay elders when we meet up for prayer on Saturday morning, they're talking about how they went out and they visited this person and that person. I was there just before that person died and prayed with them. And it's not the pastor, it's all the elders. No one of us is omnicompetent. So rejoice in the strengths that Pastor Kevin will bring to this church and pray for his weaknesses and pray for the elders that together they may provide a shepherding gift that cares for this flock and leads with integrity and advances God's purposes in this play, place. Determine before Jesus to respect and to be responsive to the man that Christ has given to us and say thank you for him. And above all things, remember, the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Well, at this time, we're going to invite Pastor Kevin to come up to the platform along with the elders, and two of our elders are missing today. Um, Eric is home sick. He's been sick for a few days, and uh, we've asked Clinton to come up, and, and uh, John had to, had to go to Indianapolis, and Paul is going to come up. These are men who have served here as elders and are godly men, and we're going to have a time of laying on of hands. And by doing that, we are conferring on to Kevin um, our, our formal recognition that he is the lead pastor here and acknowledging that he's part of us, and we want to pray for him. So, Kevin, that you would come. Father God, um, we, we pray for uh, Pastor Kevin this morning. Uh, Lord, I'd like to pray for, or thank you, Lord, for the journey that led us here to this point this morning. Uh, the past five years, um, it's been uh, fun, it's been exhausting, uh, there were challenging times, but I thank you, Lord, that we can look back now and see that your hand was on everything that we were doing, that you were guiding us, and I thank you, Lord, for those answers to prayers. Uh, you shut doors when they needed to be shut. You opened them when they needed to be opened. And I just thank you, God, that you were there the whole time leading us and uh, to this point here on this stage, on this platform right now with Pastor Kevin. I pray for the congregation, Lord. I just pray that each one of us can come here and that we prepare our hearts to come into this building and, and worship and praise the God of creation. And I, I pray that we can come together in unity, that we can come together and support and uh, encourage Pastor Kevin and, and not do that for the sake of unity or for the sake of encouragement, but for you, Lord, that you are king and that this is a church that will continue to worship and praise you, that we will bring the uncompromised word of God at this church. And I pray for Pastor Kevin and Carolyn I pray for the wisdom and knowledge that the Spirit brings to them, that they will use that to uh, integrate into this church and that they will know how to best 
amplify your, your ministry here in this church, Lord. I pray of those things in your name. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for Kevin. We thank you for his obedience to you in answering the call and to serve you here at Weberville. We pray you give him strength, help him to serve you here and help us as members, as the tenders, tenants to, to serve here, to be cooperative and see you work through this church family. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, you are a great and powerful God, uh, majestic in all that you do, and we just thank you that you love us. Thank you that you answer prayer, and uh, we have prayed for a, a permanent pastor, and you've provided. Uh, you've said uh, that whoever accepts who you send uh, accepts you, and uh, Lord, we, we do accept Pastor Kevin this morning, and we're just delighted that uh, that he's here. We'd ask, Father, that you would fill him with a, a love for this congregation and a, a love for this community. Uh, and we just pray that uh, you would fill each of us with um, a new sense of uh, excitement about serving you, uh, a new sense of uh, uh uh, what you're going to do in the future. And we pray that uh, we can uh, support Pastor Kevin and that uh, uh, your will would be done in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. And Father, we do continue to pray uh, that you would anoint this man with your power, that the surpassing power would be evidence of your hand of blessing upon him and upon this church. I pray that you would give him a deep love for you and for your word and for your gospel and your kingdom and your glory. A deep love for this church, for the people, and for this community in which we do ministry. May your blessing rest upon him, protect him from the evil one, Lead him in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Encourage his heart in all the things of God. And Father, may we look back on this moment a year from now, three years from now, five years from now, and bless you for the blessing that you have given to us because of his ministry among us. We commit him to your grace, to your mercy, to your sovereign purposes, in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Just asked if I could share something briefly. Thank you, uh, Leo. Thank you, men, for praying for me. Thank you for praying for us. I hope you can see from your perspective God's leading us here. Uh, Carolyn and I can certainly see from our perspective God is clear leading us here, and we praise God for that. I wanted you to know this. My parents um, wanted you to know that they really wanted to be here today. But my dad is 90, and uh, my mom is not far behind, and uh, they have their challenges physically and just could not be here today. But they want you to know this. Uh, they've already been praying for you, and they're praying for Carolyn and me, and uh, they, they promise that they're going to be listening to or watching uh, my preaching every Sunday, and as they do, they'll be praying for you. And so they want to give their best wishes to you and their their love to you already for calling uh, me to be your pastor and just wanted to make it very clear that they are praying for you and they are prayer warriors. Uh, I, I wish I could measure up to the level of their prayer faithfulness, but um, that's something to live up to. So they send their greetings today. And I want you to know they're praying for you and and be encouraged by that, that there are others that you've not met who are care, caring for you in prayer. And I'm praying for you already and will be in the days ahead. So uh, thank you so much, and thank you for this installation.